So what we have today, I think, is um, an extremely important topic, which is the influence of Donald Trump, who's a very different kind of American president, to say the least, on world trade, on world politics. Um, and I'm hoping with this excellent panel, um, we can also get into something of Mr. Trump's character and how he's changed politics also. The one thing I know, I met Trump more than 30 years ago when he was a businessman. And even then, as he and Ivana, then his wife, were showing me around a, a yacht he'd bought um, and had Trumpified. It was a yacht actually first owned by Jamal Khashoggi's uncle, Adnan, who was the great Saudi arms dealer. And he put it up as collateral for a big loan from the Sultan of Brunei, who sold it to Trump. And so he had a Saudi yacht, Trumpified, which is quite extraordinary to see. Lots of suede, lots of gold. Um, but even then, when being president was far from everyone's mind, Donald Trump, I remember, and I wrote this at the time, was obsessed with the sense that trade had been unfair to the United States that the Japanese then and the Germans were taking advantage of the United States. And even then, he was angry at the number of German Japanese cars on American roads. So some things don't change. But let's hear what our, our um, great experts have to say. And I thought we would begin with Michael Fuller. You can look in your books and figure out who everybody is. It's too time consuming for me to introduce them all. Michael, up to you. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. Thank you, Thierry, for hosting me. I'm proud to be, I think, one of the two Australians in the audience flying the flag. We're on the cover of The Economist this week, but we're thin on the ground in, in uh, Morocco. Um, what I'd like to do in a very short period of time is make an argument about the foreign policy consequences of President Trump. And I'll touch on four points. First of all, his foreign policy instincts. Secondly, his actions in office. Thirdly, the limitations on his actions. And fourthly, reasons to be concerned. So first of all, his instincts. And let me start exactly actually where Stephen finished. People often say lazily that Mr. Trump is stupid, his views are incoherent, but in fact, for three decades, he has had extremely coherent views on America's role in the world. And I think he came to office with more coherent views on America than other recent presidents, including President Obama and President Bush. For decades, he has held true to four core beliefs, and I've come to think of them as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first instinct that he brought to office is that he was sympathetic to isolationism, or if isolationism is too strong a word, then certainly a desire for retrenchment. We heard this during the campaign when he spoke of walling America off from its southern neighbour, reducing America's international commitments. Since the 1940s, American presidents have been seized of the advantages of global leadership. Mr. Trump is oblivious to them. Second, he was unimpressed by the alliance network through which America has traditionally projected its influence. And this is odd because China and Russia would dearly love to have an alliance network as powerful and cost effective as that of the United States. Thirdly, as Stephen intimated, he was hostile to free trade agreements, or at least those that had been negotiated by others. Of course, he could negotiate them much better than anyone else. And finally, even before he came to office, we noticed his weird affinity for strong men, such as Vladimir Putin. By contrast, he was notably lukewarm about democratically elected leaders, including in the European and Asian countries to which the United States has been allied. So those are the four instincts <clears throat> that he brought to office, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
Secondly, I would argue that in office, those instincts have in many respects, in many important respects, informed America's policies. Now, this was an argument I had with lots of analysts at the time of his election. A lot of my colleagues said the American system will wrap its arms around Mr. Trump. Um, and he will end up as a much more orthodox foreign policy president than you, you might, imagine, might imagine. But as a friend of mine said, never underestimate the impact of Mr. Trump on Trump foreign policy. Let me go through those four horsemen of the apocalypse and point out where his instincts have informed his actions. First of all, the instinct for retrenchment. We saw that in his junking of the Iran deal, pulling out of the Paris Accord, or even in the last week, the INF Treaty. Secondly, his scepticism to alliances we see all the time. He refused to endorse the collective security guarantee of the NATO Treaty for many months. He later threatened the United States could go its own way if delinquent allies did not meet spending demands. He ran down bilateral treaties with countries such as South Korea and Australia. On free trade, he withdrew from the TPP on his first full day in the White House, and he imposed hundreds of billions of dollars of tariffs on China. And finally, on strong men and his preferred uh, interlocutors, he has pursued his fixation with Mr. Putin to a degree that is difficult to understand, refusing to stand up for American democracy, accepting Mr. Putin's word over that of his own intelligence community, blaming all the problems with US-Russia relations on America, on past American behaviour, rather than Mr Putin's behaviour or indeed his interference in the US, the 2016 election. Mr Trump enjoys hanging out with a posse of authoritarians, including Mr Duterte, Mr Orban, Mr Salvini and Kim Jong-un, who is running rings around a lovesick president. So that's my second argument, that his instincts have largely informed uh, US foreign policy. However, third, there are important limits on his actions. The President's writ does not run everywhere. And two factors in particular have limited the Trump influence on his own foreign policy. The first is much discussed, and that is opposition within his own administration. The so-called deep state, the adults in the room who have to some extent prevented the President from doing irreparable damage to America's alliances and foreign relationships. They have authored strategic documents such as the National Security Strategy and the National Defence Strategy that reflect orthodox rather than Trumpian policies and somehow got Trump to sign off on them. Thank goodness for the deep state, I say. However, most of the adults ha have now left the room and there are per persistent rumours that the last two standing, John Kelly and Jim Mattis, will soon follow the others out the door, perhaps in a couple of weeks. So that's the first limitation. The secondly, secondly, and this is less discussed, the President lacks the patience, discipline and interest to implement his will. The truth is, President Trump is not really interested in solving po policy problems. He is interested in being seen to win. His style is to make a bold and unexpected move, declare victory and move on. Few believe that not having an Iran nuclear deal is a better way of preventing the Iranians from acquiring nuclear weapons than having one. Few really believe that North Korea will denuclearize, but that is to miss the point about President Trump. He is not interested in having victories, he is interested in being seen to win. So the deep state's resilience and the president's lack of interest have combined to limit the damage that Mr Trump has done. He has put America's interests in jeopardy, he has damaged international society, he has run down America's prestige, but he has not yet done irreversible harm. However, let me finish on this point. There are two reasons I think we should be a little nervous. First, Mr Trump has not yet faced an externally generated crisis crisis. Most of his problems have been internally generated. Sooner or later, he will face an externally generated crisis. We remember that President Obama came to office right in the teeth of the global financial crisis. Can you imagine if we had a similar crisis now and our last line of defence in the Oval Office was Mr Trump? Secondly, he could be goaded into making the kind of catastrophic error he hasn't yet made such as starting an unnecessary war. 
So those are the reasons to be nervous. Stephen, let me, let me finish on one final point. In 2015, I gave a series of public lectures uh, in Australia, and I was concerned then about the fraying of the international order. And so I called the, the first of these lectures present at the destruction. And this was a play on Dean Acheson's memoir about the establishment of the post-war order present at the creation. And I argued then that the country around which the post-war post order was constructed, the United States, was stepping back from the world. Other countries such as Russia and China were stepping in. The pillars supporting the order were weak. The principles that define the order were under challenge. I said the order is not necessarily finished, but it is certainly fraying. And I was criticised at the time, including by the Australian Prime Minister, for being overly gloomy as is the way with Australian Prime Ministers, he has now left the stage. But ladies and gentlemen, three years later, after Brexit, after the election of many other leaders, including Mr Duterte and others, and after the election of Mr Trump, no one is now saying that I was too gloomy. Thank you. Very good. Michael, thank you. Well, that was a really fine overview. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Um, Rosen. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so yes. I was just going to pick up on maybe uh, one of the instincts that Michael just mentioned, or actually really add to that, because I think it's an interesting framework. Um, and that is, I think the president also has a bit of an instinct for business, uh, business interests, uh, and for ways to stoke and spur economic growth. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. I would also say the president has a uh, a talent maybe for hyperbole, so I would also like to address that. So what I would like to do is maybe talk a little bit about noise and signal and talk about that in um, relation to U.S. economic performance recently and a little bit of foreign economic policy in the United States as well. So on the domestic economic policy front, I think that the Trump administration does deserve some credit uh, for spurring strong growth in the U.S. through a number of steps, policy steps that they have taken. Uh, so just this yesterday, we saw the third quarter GDP report from the U.S. It was at 3.5 percent. That's a relatively strong number. That came on the back of a 4.2 percent uh, second quarter reading. So there's really no question that in the short term, there's been a pretty strong growth spurt in the United States. Uh, we could talk about the stimulus that went into that, um, but I think there's also something to be said for things like the corporate tax reform, which we'll talk, touch on a little bit, deregulation, and a number of things that the administration has done to be pro-business and pro-growth. So on the corporate tax reform, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, it was passed within the first year of the administration, passed uh, and signed in December, uh, lowered the statutory rate from 35%, which is one of the world's highest, to 21%. Um, repealed the corporate AMT, supported business investment through a um, immediate deduction of business investment, a phase out over five years. These were all things intended to uh, push businesses into reinvesting in the United States because that investment had been quite low for many years. And that's largely succeeded. I don't think it's succeeded as much as the administration likes to claim. Um, but we have seen uh, business investment growth at around 6%. Um, the quarterly average over the last four quarters has been about 6%, which is pretty good, uh, given that it was in the low ones before that. Um, I will say the third quarter number was much, much weaker. Uh, so this is the, the story is whether there, any of this is sustainable. Um, the third quarter number didn't look particularly good, so I, I do suspect that people will begin to doubt how much of the business investment is really um, likely here to stay. Um, also on deregulation, I think you've probably been following a lot of this, but there are many people who do follow it, um, but there's been rollbacks to Dodd-Frank, there's been changes to the ACA, the uh, US healthcare uh, reform, changes to the China consumer finance, environmental standards being rolled back, housing rules being rolled back. Um, a lot of these are things that many people debate about the merits of them, but it's pretty clear many businesses really like them. Uh, and you can see it in things like business confidence surveys and others. Um, and I think if you think about the whole package, it's not surprising that after tax corporate profits in the U.S., 
We're at about 9% in the second quarter after being up at about 37%. Uh, in the first quarter and 20% in Q4. So it's a really good time to be an American business. Um, and I think the president's taking a lot of credit for that. Um, the World Economic Forum, I should mention, just recently moved the US to the top spot on its global competitive in index. So I say that because I think that it's, you need to give the Trump administration credit where credit is due. It's otherwise, it just looks very partisan. Let me now talk a little bit about places where I think they've not been as successful, where I think there's a little bit more uh, smoke and a lot less fire. Um, on the spending cuts and the personal income tax deductions, those have been um, expansionary policies at a point in the cycle where it was really not necessary to spend that kind of money. Um, very likely we'll have a significant amount of debt as a consequence and a lot, uh, very little growth to show for it. The US just ran a $780 billion deficit in the last fiscal year. Um, at a time when we were growing, as I said, at a very, very high rate. So what happens when we hit a recession uh, is a very concerning prospect because in recessions, that's just going to get worse. Um, the Trump administration has also taken aim at governance inside the United States, um, talking about right-sizing government, talking about hiring freezes and pay freezes, um, attacking whole agencies within budgetary documents that are going up to the Hill. Um, so there's been kind of an attack on governance itself in the United States, which I think is deeply concerning, having just come out of the administration uh, in August. It was a very difficult thing to, to watch, very difficult to work for an administration that had you tagged as deep state and did not really care to hear your expertise. Um, let me talk a little bit about some failures, uh, just outright failures. They have not passed the infrastructure bill, one of the very, the most bipartisan, probably one of the most pro-growth bills they could have done. They really do not deserve a lot of credit for um, any of the long-term growth that they've promised. Uh, my view is on the supply side, there's no way that this is gonna add up to 3%, um, and they've tried to balance the budget on 3%. Uh, so the, the best the U.S. is gonna do is probably two to two and a half, and that has to do with productivity growth and labor force growth, both of which are not nearly where they were before. Um, promising 3% growth was um, very misleading in my view. Um, and finally, let me just make one last point on the economy. Um, I think the, United, the administration so far has failed to deliver on its core promises to its core constituents. Um, so the Trump phenomenon is really built around a struggling white, lower middle class American voter um, who have been in a lot of pain um, over the last two decades, who have not seen their incomes rise, who've seen unbelievable amounts of social distress in their communities, including a report that just came out from CDC, our uh, Center for Disease Control, with 71,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States in the last 12 months. So that's more than we lost in the Vietnam War just in the last 12 months. Um, so some of these communities have been absolutely devastated by the slow growth, the loss of industry, and other things. They're angry, they're blaming everyone else, including foreign trading partners, um, which the president conveniently um, can use. But he is not delivering yet on wage earnings or wage growth for those um, populations. And the reason that's going to be very hard to do is because we haven't raised productivity yet. So unless these reforms can really spur productivity growth, I don't see how we're going to get the wage growth that we need um, to really uh, improve the lives of those key voters. Um, so I'll stop there. Since we that's great. Thank you very, very much. No, I, I was very struck by that. I mean, I think the total in Vietnam was 58,000. So it's almost 10,000 more. Can I just ask you a quick question? We, we, we've talked a lot about the cumulative debt in Italy and Greece, but given what's going on with the deficit, I mean, how big a problem will this be down the road with this tax cut? I mean, people suggest American debt to GDP is, yeah. is getting up to that magic 100%. Yes. What do you think? Um, I think if you look at the CBS, so it entirely depends on the growth assumptions, which is why I went to that growth.
growth story. Mm -hmm. So the administration is telling a story about 3% growth. If you get those numbers, you can actually see debt to GDP stabilize and come down. Although you have to have a lot of spending cuts to do that too, which I don't think are gonna happen because they're so politically unpopular. Um, so without that, without 3% and without spending cuts, right, we are getting closer to 100% yeah. GDP. Um, and I think when the president has been critical of the, mm, the Fed recently in terms of calling the Fed loco and other things, <laughs> um, my, my personal somewhat cynical view on that is that he's trying to get ahead of the fact that there's going to be crowding out um, in the uh, bond markets as a consequence of the U.S. trying to place considerable more debt. So what you're seeing is the yields rising, which is raising the cost of borrowing for the government. Um, yields are now above 3%, 3.14%. And, and I think that pressure from the fiscal side is actually feeding into that. So to deflect that, let's just blame the Fed for raising rates. Great. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Uh, Mr. Fujisaki, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, very glad to be here. Uh, I was in the United States uh, only a week ago, and uh, that's why I feel rather free, because I'm not going back for another several months. I don't think I have to be afraid that I'll be stopped at the border, saying that you said that about our country, so uh, I'm going to be very honest today. Now, I'll talk about US-China, China, Japan, and uh, U.S. Japan. Uh, Japan, uh, uh, U.S. China. The manner of uh, Trump administration is something a little bit more than a lot of us were expected. However, it is true that there are elements that has to be said sometime, and uh, like IPR. I thought. We had gone through that in 70s and 80s, and Japan was told a lot, and we called it gaiatsu, uh, the foreign pressure. I thought, why is it not said to Chinese? Is it too big to complain? So I'm not trying to defend everything that Mr. Trump has been saying, but there's some truth in that as well. However, one concern is that uh, there's some similarity between maybe Mr. Xi and Mr. Trump. That is, they want to hear only about what they want to hear so from their surroundings. So that's the, something we have to be concerned. Japan, China, now we are moving. Prime Minister was in Beijing yesterday, greeted very warmly, first time in seven years. It's China that has changed because of the international environment. They have come around to us, I think. Uh, and I think it's very good. The, now the key word is from competition to cooperation. However, we will not change partners. One uh, example, Pew Research Center of the United States had a uh, res uh, research uh, re uh, uh, issued on October the 1st, only three weeks ago, in, it, in which they wow. asked around in many countries of the world, which would be the leader in the future, China or United States? Only two countries in the world said, people said, 80, more than 80% of people said it should remain as United States. They asked in France, they asked in UK, they asked in Germany, they asked in back, Thailand, Korea, everywhere. But only two countries. That was United States and Japan. So Japan, Japanese people still have a big confidence in United States because of, I think, the values. Freedom of speech, democracy, human rights, which we don't share 100% with China. Third, Japan-US relations. I think uh, it's pretty good because we've been able to manage problems. Bilateral issues, we have just agreed on trade on goods. And it's pity that US have uh, opted out from uh, TPP, UNESCO, Paris Accord, but I think we are going to do 
by ourselves with other countries, like-minded countries, and we can wait for the United States to ch change mind and come back. It's not maybe this administration, but next administration, and we can wait. So, like the movie 50 years ago, Shane, the movie Shane, I'm always saying, in the end, young boys calling out to Shane, come back in the wild, Wyoming. Uh, and I think uh, we always say, America, come back. And, uh, I think I really think we can do that in two, three years. Now, lastly, a lot of people think that America has been so stable a partner and it has moved. I don't take that view. So maybe, maybe Americans would like to divide me, challenge me, but look what happened in 1971 to 72. Mr. Nixon suddenly changed dollar gold policy. He changed China policy. All of us were shocked because we were following blindly the United States when Brits and France has already moved out and supported uh, Beijing, but we were behind. In 1990s, uh, when Korea, North Korea was uh, dealing some, doing some bad things, Mr. Clinton said, we're going to give light water reactor to North Korea. What happened? Korea and Japan followed. Mr. Bush uh, came out and said, Bush 43 said, no way. And Mr. Bush started the Iraq war. Britain, uh, I'm sorry, uh, France and Germany no, said no. US and uh, Japan followed. Mr. Obama came out and said that was wrong. Now Mr. Trump is saying everything that Mr. Obama did was wrong. So when US comes out and say, hey, uh, we are going to play tango, let's play tango. We are going to say waltz, let's play waltz. That the disc jockey is always the United States. And we were dancing. And I think. Uh, uh, maybe the next leader will change the music and will change the tone. So I think we can wait. And uh, one last thing is that Americans are very smart people. They know that uh, the world institution that is made by United States, the best bene most beneficiary is United States. That's why U.S. economy is so good. So they'll wake up sometime. Thank you. That's wonderful, Ichiro. Thank you very, very much. Um, it is true, I, I think the United States is a very difficult partner, very difficult date, very hard to predict, has lots of mood swings. That continues. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wang, please. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Excellent. Um, I think <coughs> Donald Trump is divisive force in the United States as well as in world politics. And divisiveness is not, divisive is not the only adjective I want to add to his uh, description, but I don't want, I refrain from using other words here. Um, he is divisive as world politics is more divided. I think the, United States, uh, the world has been more divided since the end of the Cold War. And when we look at world politics, uh, we see three different things. Uh, first is the combination of rising populism and rising nationalism. And they are reinforcing each other as represented in the United States and elsewhere. The second trend I see is the rise of authoritarianism and great man politics, which are also represented by Trump in the United States and by some others in other countries. The third thing I see is the intensified geopolitical competition. We see that in China-US relations. We see that in, uh, in the Middle East between Iran and Saudi Arabia and some other countries. We see that in the US-Russian relationship. But the third trend I described, geopolitical competition, is that representative of the Trump administration we will have to see. If I move to the US-China relationship, Trump himself has waged trade war with China. What, what are 
his goals. What does he want to achieve in the trade war with China? There are two different expectations. The first trend, the first uh, interpretation is that Trump wants to uh, address the trade deficit. He wants China to buy more uh, goods from the United States, and he wants uh, manufacturers go back to the United States. But uh, this is Trump. But what are the other objectives? Uh, I think what, one other explanation is uh, the United States wants to change China's industrial policies. Uh, IPR is one thing. And especially people are focusing on high-tech competition between the United States and China. There's the fear that China may catch up with the United States in terms not only economic growth, economic uh, out, uh, output, but also high-tech capabilities. That view is represented by Trump's advisors like Navarro, uh, Lifesizer, uh, uh, Cutlow, and some others. And the third view uh, about the US-China uh, trade war is that the trade war is meant to prevent China from rising up as a global great power. This is related to power politics, geo geopolitical competition. And this is also related to uh, uh, road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And I think these people are also uh, have their voices in the White House, uh, like John Bolton. And this is ma mainly power politics. The fourth view, on the fourth perspective, is that the United States want to undermine the leadership of the Communist Party in China. They, they are now talking about human rights violations in Tibet and Xinjiang and the religious problems and so on and so forth. And they have their voices in Congress. And uh, the, the thing we don't really know is whether Trump is taking care of uh, human rights. I don't think that is his feature, uh, his, his, his thinking. But, all the four trends I'm talking about in China, all the explanations in China-US uh, trade war, uh, uh, what we see in the United States policy toward China, uh, trade deficit, uh, IPR or industrial policies, uh, power politics or great power competition, and China itself, whether China is moving in the right direction, uh, in the view of the United States, or China is, a, a lot, is violating human rights and so on and so forth. And that is also related to China's world view, China's world uh, behavior. So Trump is actually cons controversial in China. I don't think it is exaggeration to say that Trump's image in China is probably better than in Europe, uh, in large of the Middle East. I don't know whether China's his image is better in Japan or in China, but uh, why is he controversial? I think first, some people like him because he represents some kind of political correctness in the, in the United States, and those people who those people who like Trump do not like multiculturalism. They have their uh, voices expressed uh, by some kind of reservation about uh, immigration <coughs> to China from Africa, from some Islamic countries. And they are afraid of Islamism, uh, tr uh, Islamic ex extremism that is reflected in China. The, sec the second grouping who like Trump may be uh, they are seeing in China's foreign policy uh, uh, communities that Trump is helping China. He is damaging the United States in the world, giving way to China's rights, so we should welcome Trump. He is, he is doing a lot of harm to US images in the world, so China has more strategic opportunities. And the third grouping who admire admires Trump is that uh, 
he is a leader who delivers, who uh, fulfills his promises, and he gives the United States economic uh, advantage and, 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 and surging. So, uh, he, so some people even say that press, Trump's pressure on China may help China's economic reform and opening to the outside world. So that is not necessarily bad. China should take this advantage of competing with the United States so, and China could improve its uh, IPR records uh, and, and so on and so forth. So this is my description of Trump in China. That's very good, Mr. Wang, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, um, Mr. Michael's theory, which he gave us earlier, um, is that <coughs> Trump acts tough as a negotiator, but is very happy to claim a modest success as the greatest success in the world. <laughs> and if, if I'm not misreading you, Michael. So, is that the view in China, do you think? Or, or is Trump more worrisome to the Chinese as a challenger perhaps too early for China's future? I think it depends on who you are talking about in China. Uh, and in government officials are hesitant as to what China, Trump's role is in US-China relations. Trump himself claims many times that uh, he sees Xi Jinping as his good friend. And he respects Xi Jinping. He, and actually, he wants to establish direct connections with not only uh, uh, Putin, but also Iranian leader and Kim Jong-un. So what's wrong with his connection with the Chinese top leadership? That is one thing we can take advantage of. But also, people say that he is very unpredictable. For instance, if, if China makes some major concessions in trade with the United States, will he be satisfied, or will he put more pressure on China? That is quite debatable in China itself. Yes, yes, I think it's debatable everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, the larger view, but a view from Korea, I think, mm -hmm. Mr. Rujin Roy, please, you have the floor. Well, first of all, those uh, baseball fans like me, the Dodgers just won in the 18th inning, so okay. I was gonna give, uh, sorry about you being the Red Sox fan, but uh, anyway, um, this is my third year in a row um, in being on this panel on Donald Trump, and I either did a great job or I may be the only one who said anything good about Trump, and I sus suspiciously believe it's the latter. Last year, I had, to, uh, I had to fly back to Korea uh, right after my session uh, at the World Policy uh, Conference. As President Moon invited me uh, to a state dinner he was hosting for President Trump. As I was walking down the receiving line, I wondered about what should I say to the President. I got about eight seconds. So I told him, Mr. President, I like your tweets. Keep tweeting. In which he re replied, believe me, I'll be tweeting more. And I'm going to tweet one tomorrow morning, and you'll see it. And so, yes, I take part of the blame, uh, but seriously, it is his tweets that has made him different from any other presidents in the U.S. or, in, matter of fact, any other leaders in the world. And it works in America. The intellects and the press don't like it, but if you are a common American who works in a factory like mine in the Midwest, they like to hear uh, directly from uh, Trump. They don't want to read New York Times. It's too sophisticated for them. So um, whether, you, whether, whether, he's, whether what he says is true or not, uh, they rather hear it directly from their leader instead of, instead of through, uh, through the press. And every time Trump tweets, it becomes national news and headline news. Um, and whether, whatever you said about him, whether it's kind of controversial, it, it is entertaining. And American loves entertainment. You know, you got to be used to it. So I have uh, my own formula. I call it the 30-30-40 formula. Believe 30% of what he says. Verify 30% of what he says. And let me now talk about how Trump negotiates. He always starts with threats. 
Look how he first threatened uh, about leaving NATO and how he ended up getting the NATO countries to pay more for the defense. Look at how he threatened about getting out of NAFTA. Now he has a new deal with Canada and Mexico. He threatened Korea about getting rid of a U.S.-Korea free trade agreement. Now we have a new one, which is not that much different from the original one. He just to win, wants to win and uh, put his, uh, gives his point. Look at how he threatened North Korean Kim Jong-un about striking first and how his button was bigger than his. And now he had a meeting with Kim Jong-un, and now they are in a love affair, at least for the time being, according to Trump. So I'm not that worried about the trade issues the U.S. has with China. I think in the end, the Chinese will blink, and I think there will be some kind of an agreement. I'm also kind of uh, cautiously optimistic that he may come back to the TTP. You know, they, at least he wants to listen and talk. So uh, those are some of the things that I think you have to, so don't believe anything, everything he tweets, but look at what he does in the process and, how, and what kind of action he takes. It's really going to be a do or die election for Donald Trump. If he wins both, if the Republicans wins, wins both the House and the Senate, he will have a very good chance of becoming a two-term president. If the Republican loses the House and wins the Senate, as most people are predicting, he will be handicapped uh, with, the, with this budget. The, the, uh, he, the, the, uh, the Democrats will be uh, controlling the budgets. One thing for sure, he won't be able to build that big wall in the border of the U.S. and Mexico if the, the Democrats win. If he loses both the House and the Senate, he will be in real trouble and could possibly uh, face impeachment depending on the outcome of the mirror uh, investigations. Like Trump or not, I still believe America is the greatest country in the world. And yes, America and the world will survive Donald Trump, whether it's two more years or four more years. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that note of optimism. Um, it is worth pointing out, I think you're quite right, that even Barack Obama got probably more done in his first two years when he controlled both houses of Congress than he did in the next six. And partly because he didn't control the, the, certainly the Senate, it's why the JCPOA and the Paris Agreement, none of them were put forward to the Senate. They just stayed as agreements, which is why Mr. Trump felt he could abrogate them. Um, it's very helpful, thank you. Um, I just wondered very quickly if um, you think this tactic's going to actually work with Kim Jong-un, or, or, or is this still very unclear? I can't imagine North Korea is going to denuclearize. That seems mad for them. If you ask the same question about his father, Kim Jong-un, I would have no chance that he's going to negotiate. But with his son, I feel a little different. I think this guy has a little bit of a heart, and he actually cares about his people. So. If Trump's becomes a two-term president, and if he keeps threatening and doing that thing, I think there is an answer to this. So I'm one of the, those few. They, 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 they said I was crazy, but I, I, always, I, I, I am a believer that, you know, depending on how they negotiate, mm -hmm. there's could be a, there, there could be a solution. Yes, good. And, and it would help if China, again, turned the screw a little bit more rather than turning it back half on the other a hand, notch. I don't think, but, uh, uh, but to add, add to that, I think Kim Jong-un is also unhappy or not, can't trust the Chinese completely. That's why he's also moving with the U.S. and Korea, because he doesn't. And Kim Jong-il, his father, never trusted the Chinese, and yes. that was one thing he advised Kim Jong-un said, don't ever trust the Chinese. So those are some of the, no, no, no. I'm sorry I have to mention that to you, but no, it's not my just on record, but no, that's but, what they said, so I'm, yeah, just, no, of course. I'm just coding. Yes, no, yeah. that's, that's one of the reasons I think he will yeah. keep nuclear weapons. Yeah. And it's I have to about go to China. China. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I have to go anyway. to China next week, so I need, to, I need the visa, so I don't, I'm not, don't please take it seriously. Well, don't have lunch with Xi Jinping. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'll get invited, thank you. <laughs> Igor, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, special thanks to Thierry de Montbrial, because this is an excellent opportunity for the Russians to pronounce what they think about the global governance which is the enigmatic thing for most of us. Uh, uh, looking at 
Trump from this Soviet Russian retrospective, I would say that uh, there could be two options. First, this is a cyclical Trump. By this I mean that for the Soviets, the change from Carter to Nixon was the similar thing, even worse. Or for example, from Kennedy to Nixon. So for, for, for us, it's sort of a cyclical thing when uh, this great nation changes course because social justice versus economic efficiency one, one wins or loses. And he symbolizes at the moment, as our American colleague said, this boost for the economic efficiency of the, of the uh, ruling class. Uh, so, as Paul Kennedy said once in his famous book, The Rise and the Fall of the Superpowers, that could be the rise of the United States, or that could be a fall of the United States easily because the uh, United States can overextend itself. And it looks like uh, protectionism, demagoguery, and populism could overextend the United States. This, uh, we, we were talking about trade wars. We all know that protectionism has its limits. It will backfire on demand and supply chain sooner or later. This war with China has its limits, and so on and so forth. So from this point of view, I think that uh, I'm on the side of those who think that uh, uh, American people will give its answers to all these questions by their own history, institutions, tradition, and uh, they will uh, uh, temper the, 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 the president. This obsession can be, Trump obsession can be cured by American history and uh, institutions. Uh, for, for the Russians, uh, Trump is a great catalyzer uh, of the creation of the bipolar world, or the return to the bipolar world, authoritarianism versus liberalism. Uh, if at the beginning of, uh, uh, of this century, we had uh, uh, a naive uh, ideas and hopes that Russia will join European family, as one of the members, now it's, it's over. Uh, we, we are pushed into the uh, natural or unnatural alliance uh, dash marriage with, uh, with our great uh, partner China uh, and with other authoritarian regimes like Turkey, like uh, South America, like uh, Vietnam, uh, and so on and so forth. So from this point of view, he catalyzed the creation of bipolar world but in a way, it's more balanced international system, which we know how to handle. We do remember this bipolar world, which managed to create Helsinki agreements, which managed to do many other things. Because we are, by definition, cannot be all liberals. By definition, certain nations cannot be the nations of the rule of law, democracy, liberal democracy, open market, and so on and so forth. By definition, through historical stage, at the moment, we are much closer to China than, than to Europe. And he catalyzed by his behavior this thing. Good question on which side of the equation he is. And this question was raised many times here. And from this point of view, he will, of course, uh, bring some kind of a disbalance. I don't want to, to, to deal with the personal questions because uh, so many things were said or, or rather not said by Mr. Mueller and, and, and the whole of the group which uh, uh, explores the possibilities on, or investigates how Mr. Putin manipulates Mr. Trump. We'll see it soon. They will meet in, in Paris, and then they will meet next year in, in Washington. And if Trump is manipulated by Putin, American people will see that. Uh, I have my doubts that uh, we are so powerful. Never were. But uh, from the point of view of people gathered here at this room, I think we, we, we can go back to the uh, global governance as, as the question what to do in this situation of bipolarity, big question marks, a lot of uncertainties, and so on and so forth. So for me, uh, uh, from me to long term, we have different questions and different challenges. We know that four billion people very soon will have problems having fresh water. We know that about 11 big cities, megapolises of, of this world, in, in 10 years' time will have 
will run out of this fresh water. We know that uh, around three trillion dollars is, is 30, 30, excuse me, trillion dollars is hidden in the in the in the offshore uh, jurisprudences and is not used for the betterment of, of where we live, for the commodities and services we need. So we have to talk about very good global governance. And while big people fight at these lunches, Xi Jinping, Putin, poisoning Trump, and versa versa. We have to think about what do we do? Middle-sized countries, uh, in good integrations like European Union, uh, other integrations. What do we do with this global governance? Where do we go forward from here? Because we're, we're ex extinguishing the civilization we're living in. So from this point of view, I think that uh, new enlightenment, new convergence of religion and science, new recipes for the convergence of this economic efficiency and social justice of, of communism and socialism, if you want, uh, and capitalism. That, those are the questions which the, the gathering like this has to be much more occupied with than uh, this particular very difficult stage of the existence of Trump as the leader of the free world. I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Spasiba Bolshaya. Um, I hope um, we will go to the audience after Mr. Vedrina. So please have some questions. Think of things that you want to ask particular panelists so we don't end up having lots of empty responses to particular questions. Um, so, Mr. Vedrina, à vous. Alors, notre sujet de ce matin, c'est les conséquences de Trump. Je dirais tout de suite que pour moi, elles sont euh, <coughs> considérables, presque toutes négatives, même s'il peut obtenir un certain nombre de, de succès économiques à long terme, en tout cas du point de vue de son électorat. Mais il faut ajouter aussitôt que les conséquences, ça dépend de la durée. Ce n'est pas la même chose selon que ça dure jusqu'à la fin de ce mandat ou s'il y a un autre mandat après. Et on ne peut pas dire aujourd'hui si M. Trump finira en prison ou réélu. Donc ça change tout sur la durée et sur l'appréciation. Je dirais par ailleurs que euh, moi, je ne le considère pas comme isolationniste. Je sais bien que pour les libéraux et les néoconservateurs interventionnistes, euh, ils le considèrent comme isolationniste. Je pense que c'est un contresens il y a eu d'autres isolationnistes dans l'histoire américaine, il y a longtemps, mais qui, tout simplement, c'est quelqu'un qui veut avoir les mains libres. Donc c'est plutôt une sorte d'égoïsme brutal, à court terme, qu'une sorte d'isolationnisme théorique, et ceux qui le prennent pour un isolationniste risquent d'avoir des surprises dans la suite. Après, je suis d'accord avec la première intervention qui rappelait qu'il y a une cohérence très simpliste, qui est frustre, mais une cohérence dans tout ce que dit Trump, dans sa vision des rapports de force et des, du monde depuis, depuis le début. Et après, je ferai quatre remarques. Conséquences sur les États-Unis eux-mêmes. Trump n'est pas à l'origine de toute la violence américaine, mais il l'aggrave sur tous les plans. Sa façon d'être, son comportement, ses, ses mots, sa façon d'être président, aggrave de façon tragique le climat d'affrontement dans ce pays qui, je crois, n'a jamais été aussi divisé depuis la guerre de sécession. Il y a une sorte d'élément de haine, presque, aux États-Unis. Et pour le Parti démocrate, il me semble que ça reste un challenge très, très compliqué que de réussir à garder le soutien des, des multiples minorités tout en réussissant à parler à l'électorat classe moyenne blanche dont on a parlé. Apparemment, le Parti démocrate n'a pas trouvé le, le populiste démocrate modéré qui pourrait euh, surmonter cette contradiction. On verra s'ils y arrivent. Ça, c'est la conséquence sur les États-Unis. Image des États-Unis dans le monde, elle n'est elle est pas mauvaise partout, parce que Trump est, est très, très aimé en Israël, en Pologne, dans différents pays. Mais elle est, elle est globalement mauvaise, mais impressionnante. Donc même ceux qui sont... Euh, qui trouvent ça épouvantable, ont peur de quelque chose. C'est un élément de force. 
dans, dans le monde brutal dans lequel nous sommes. Deuxième remarque. Jusqu'où, quelles sont les conséquences de Trump par rapport aux au pays avec lesquels il y a un bras de fer évident Avec la Chine, ça va aller jusqu'où Moi, je pense que ça peut aller assez loin, à la fois sur le plan commercial et économique. Je n'exclus pas qu'un jour, il y ait un affrontement vrai, notamment en ce qui concerne la libre circulation, la question des mers de Chine, libre circulation. Là, il y a quand même un antagonisme de projet qui est assez clair. J'imagine qu'il sera géré le moment venu, mais on n'est pas sûr par rapport à ça. Mais ça, ce n'est pas que Trump. Ça a commencé avant Trump, ça se poursuivra après Trump. Mais la première question est chinoise. États-Unis, Chine. Sur la Russie, ça a été évoqué. La question, on n'a pas la réponse. Est-ce que Trump réussira à imposer par rapport à la Russie une relation, euh, disons, réaliste, réaliste brutale avec des deals ou est-ce qu'il sera empêché de faire ça par l'État profond américain, qui est totalement contre cette, cette politique On verra, on n'en sait rien. Au Moyen-Orient, là aussi, je pense qu'il est un facteur d'aggravation. Euh, la politique avant l'affaire Khashoggi, c'est une alliance entre Trump, l'Arabie de Mohamed Ben Salman et l'Israël de Netanyahou pour imposer un blocus à l'Iran, il faut employer les termes, sur la base d'une conception absolument scandaleuse du droit international, mais qui a été acceptée par tout le monde depuis très très longtemps, qui sont les sanctions unilatérales. Ce n'est pas Trump qui les a inventées, il les aggrave, il les utilise de façon violente, mais ce n'est pas lui qui les a inventées. Et dans l'état actuel des choses, un président comme ça peut prendre en otage toute l'économie mondiale, dollarisée, numérisée, qui passe par Swift, etc., Bon. Alors, est-ce qu'il va réussir à renverser le régime iranien, comme c'est le but Créer une guerre civile D'en sortirait, dans cette théorie, un régime meilleur pour l'Occident Tout ça est très fol amour. Hein. On n'en sait rien, mais c'est la question principale. Est-ce que l'affaire Khashoggi fait que se réveille aux États-Unis un lobby anti-saoudien, en fait, qui était très puissant depuis le 11 septembre, mais qui avait été mis au second plan parce que l'objectif... De, de, de se venger du régime iranien était plus fort que l'autre. On ne sait pas très bien, mais sur ce sujet comme sur les autres que j'ai cités, sauf sur potentiellement la Russie, Trump n'est qu'un facteur d'aggravation. Après, on ne sait pas jusqu'où. Troisième remarque. Trump a un effet de démoralisation sur les alliés. L'ensemble des pays alliés protégés par les États-Unis, évidemment en Europe, mais aussi en Asie. Donc ils sont déboussolés, désemparés. La question par rapport à ça, c'est qu'est-ce que ça va entraîner Est-ce que ça crée de nouvelles alliances On en voit peut-être les prémices en Asie, c'est fragile. Est-ce que ça va déclencher quelque chose de sérieux en Europe la, la déclaration la plus importante en Europe depuis le, que M. Trump est président, c'est celle de Mme Merkel, qui a dit l'an dernier, qu'il a répété, on ne plus, on peut plus vraiment compter sur eux, donc on doit s'organiser plus entre nous. Mais ça n'a pas eu de suite pratique pour le moment. Est-ce que c'est un déclenchement Est-ce que dans la tête des Européens, ça va ouvrir une nouvelle phase marquée par la volonté systématique d'être moins dépendant des États-Unis tout en restant allié Même si c'est le cas, c'est caché. Mais ça peut être une sorte d'obsession mentale dont les répercussions se verront dans 5 ans, dans 10 ans, peut-être. Donc par rapport aux, aux alliés, là aussi, c'est la question des conséquences. Je dirais que la conséquence globale, principale, si je synthétise, est la plus grave, c'est que le comportement de Trump fait sauter les inhibitions, fait sauter toute une série de, de verrous, pas simplement ceux de la décence et de la bonne éducation, c'est beaucoup plus grave. Il y a une sorte de désinhibition, notamment dans le domaine dont Laurent Fabius a parlé très bien hier soir au dîner, sur la question écologique qui ne concerne pas que le climat, mais la biodiversité, les océans, les forêts, etc. etc. L'attitude de Trump consistant à dire tout ça n'existe pas, c'est négligeable, libère l'attitude des autres, qui par exemple, c'est l'exemple que prenait Laurent Fabius, dans l'affaire de la COP21, n'avait accepté le mouvement que parce qu'il y avait l'engagement d'Obama, le changement d'attitude de la Chine, l'orchestration Hollande Fabius à la française, etc. Ça crée un mouvement qui s'imposait en quelque sorte. Dès lors que les États-Unis sortent, 
même s'il y a la Californie, même s'il y a beaucoup d'entreprises, même s'il y a beaucoup de chercheurs, ça libère les comportements des autres, et c'est donc absolument gravissime sur l'écologie, mais aussi sur le reste. Parce que le comportement de, de Trump, je ne disais pas isolationniste, si tout le monde devenait isolationniste, replié dans son coin, c'est une régression lamentable, mais ce n'est pas automatiquement dangereux. Alors que son comportement qui n'est pas isolationniste, qui est égoïste, brutal, potentiellement interventionniste à sa façon, cautionne d'abord ceux qui étaient déjà comme ça avant, du genre Poutine ou Netanyahou, mais des tas d'autres en fait. Donc il pense, je pense qu'il peut y avoir un effet d'entraînement, de, de généralisation de ce type d'attitude, de violence pas que verbale. Qu'est-ce que ça nous donne comme monde après Trump Alors, je le redis, ça dépend quand c'est le monde après, après Trump. Quel est l'état du monde occidental À mon avis, plus mauvais. Pour le monde occidental, c'est déjà très compliqué d'avoir à admettre que l'Occident n'a plus le monopole de la puissance. Au moment de la fin de l'Union soviétique, le monde occidental a déliré totalement. Sur la fin de l'histoire, on a gagné, on va imposer nos conceptions partout. C'est exactement l'inverse qui s'est produit. L'histoire s'est remise en marche, mais euh, nous n'avons plus le monopole. Je ne vais pas aussi loin que euh, Kishore Mabubani, le penseur de Singapour, qui considère que c'est la fin de la parenthèse occidentale. Je ne dis pas ça, je ne dis pas fin de la parenthèse, je dis fin du monopole. Mais même ça, les États-Unis ont du mal à s'adapter à ça. On voit d'ailleurs dans les élections présidentielles américaines que les, les électeurs choisissent d'un extrême à l'autre à la fin de chaque président. Quant aux Européens, ils sont toujours dans une sorte de, de bulle sur ces questions. Donc un monde, un monde occidental encore moins bien placé après Trump qu'avant pour admettre de façon réaliste les nouvelles donnes dans le monde et défendre ses, ses intérêts vitaux et ses valeurs. Donc ça dépendra en réalité des autres. Et dans les conséquences de Trump, il faut dépasser tout ça et se dire qu'est-ce que les autres vont faire est-ce qu'il y a une réaction un peu coordonnée, ou en tout cas convergente Il ne suffit pas de faire des, euh, des sermons sur le multilatéralisme, il faut que le, le, faire fonctionner la coopération internationale. Je suis convaincu que les États-Unis reviendront, non pas à la théorie du multilatéralisme, mais à la, à la pratique de la coopération internationale, quand ils auront vu l'échec relatif euh, pendant Trump de ça et à cause de la question chinoise et d'autres questions. Ils y reviendront à leur façon, en essayant de l'orienter. Mais ce n'est pas tout de suite, c'est dans longtemps. Donc, pour moi, la question principale, c'est qu'est-ce que l'ensemble de ceux qui sont inquiets, choqués, désemparés, etc., comment est-ce qu'ils vont s'organiser dans la période qui nous sépare du moment où les États-Unis deviendront un partenaire de la coopération internationale bon. Merci bien, monsieur. <rire> Um, I would like to, je, uh, je vous demanderai une question, si c'est possible, mais um, en anglais. Um, there's a debate in Europe about how symptomatic Trump is of an altered American role in the world, or whether he's a, something temporary a kind of interlude. And my impression wandering around Europe is it's still tetanisé by Trump. It's still kind of paralyzed by Trump. It really doesn't know how to respond. It's certainly not responding in any coordinated fashion. So that's what I wanted to ask you. I mean, is it your sense this is changing? Are people beginning to coordinate their responses? Um, and in this debate about whether Trump is an interlude or symptomatic of, of a structural change in American life, what, what do you think? Si les, si les Européens considèrent que Trump est une parenthèse, il n'y aura pas de réaction. Ce sera la politique de l'autruche. Mais on va attendre, c'est un cauchemar, ça va s'arrêter. S'ils sont convaincus que ça va durer plus longtemps, ça peut provoquer quelque chose. Mais jusqu'ici, les, les Européens étaient épouvantés à l'idée d'avoir à sortir de la situation qui s'est installée après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, c'est-à-dire une protection, 
avec des protestations permanentes entre la, de la part des États-Unis qui payent trop, les Européens et qui ne sont pas contents des modalités de la protection et qui en doutent depuis la vieille, vieille théorie de la flexible response qui a introduit un doute par rapport à ça, mais ça continuait par rapport à ça. Donc, euh, ça pourrait évoluer dans un sens plus constructif. Si euh, on pense que Trump, c'est un phénomène long et que même avec Trump, Trump représente quand même quelque chose de profond de l'Amérique qui va durer après lui, il faut s'organiser autrement. C'est pour ça que j'ai cité Mme Merkel, parce que précisément l'Allemagne est centrale par rapport à ça. Et donc la réponse idéale, ce serait une combinaison de Mme Merkel, il faut qu'on s'organise mieux entre nous, et d'une vieille formule classique de la politique étrangère française, nous sommes les amis des Américains, nous sommes alliés aux États-Unis, mais nous ne sommes pas alignés. En général, les États-Unis n'aiment pas ça, parce qu'ils considèrent que les alliés doivent être alignés, mais s'il y avait une évolution, ce serait dans ce sens. Est-ce qu'il y a des signes en Europe de ça Franchement, très, très faible. Il y a quelques petits signes. Ça peut se transformer, peut-être. Oui. Okay. Bon, merci. Just out of curiosity, would anyone else on the panel like to talk to that question, which I think we haven't quite discussed, which is how emblematic is Trump of a structural change in the United States, or is he this kind of shocking interlude that was an accident, and and then we'll go back to something different, but not so different. Did that, that's any, Ross, do you, do you want to? I would probably frame it not as he being the structural change, but as many structural changes happening in the United States and he becoming kind of a symptom of them. So as I mentioned earlier, right, so very stagnant economic and wage growth in many parts of the country, uh, a deindustrialization across uh, many parts of the country, uh, a lot of uh, internal my, or migration into the country and then out migration for many communities. So I, I use a personal example. I have 16 first cousins on, on um, both sides of the family um, and from the Midwest, all from Ohio and Wisconsin and all born in the Midwest. Only four of them still live in the Midwest. Um, and that happened in one generation. Um, and that kind of hollowing out of the Midwest, the heartland, the hollowing out of the middle class, has been going on for 20 years in the United States. It just didn't seem to ever percolate up. And I think the US you know, leadership, and this is both Democrats and Republicans, have really not explained well the benefits of integration, of openness. So I guess I could disagree a little bit with some of the people on the pattern who think Ameri American voters are going to be very smart and understand you know, why we should be engaged internationally. I actually am not quite sure about that. I don't think we've done a great job of explaining the benefits um, to the average American voter. Um, and as a consequence, I think, you know, there's a lot of doubts about what the benefits for American leadership are if you're in like Canton or Toledo, Ohio. Uh, so I, I do okay. wonder. Thank you. Michael, did you want to say something? I think both, um I think both points are correct. I think clearly something was happening before Trump. That's the point I was trying to make. A lot of people observed that President Obama was more interested in build, building the nation at home than building the, the order abroad. But what is different about President Trump is that he's not, uh, he doesn't, whereas Mr. Obama had a sort of a cool analytical view that the US role in the world was changing, um, President Obama is active, President Trump is acti actually actively hostile to that role. It's not that he doesn't feel they can sustain it anymore. He feels that America has been, um, has been a schmuck. Mm -hmm. That he does, you know, the, the, the current leader of the free world doesn't believe in the free world and he doesn't want to lead it. He doesn't think that it's in America's interests to, um, To, to lead in a way. He, he believes much more in the brutal application of superior negotiating power in a dog-eat-dog, zero-sum sort of way. So I think that's, a, that's an important change. The second point to make is that can the system, can America go back to what it was after four years of Trump or after eight years of Trump? And I think the jury is out on that because we already see in public opinion polls that 
Mr Trump is changing the views of Republicans, for example, about alliances, about uh, trade and yep. about other issues like about that. About Russia. About Russia. Yeah. And I don't think those views are going to snap back easily. Um, the third point I'd make, and, and I say this as someone from the Asia Pacific, is that um, I think there are real questions about the future of both the United States and China. And this is why it's such a discombobulating uh, moment. Uh, we, we're talking about Mr. Trump, but equally on the, on the China side, we don't know how China, China, there is a bipolarity to Chinese behavior, sometimes very skillful, sometimes very hard and forward leaning. Uh, and we don't know the, how the contours of this relationship will work, whether the current uneasy competition will slide into uh, actual confrontation, which will be deeply uncomfortable for all of us. So a country like Australia worries both about a feckless America, which is what we're talking about, but also about a potentially reckless China in yep. the future. So I think you have to keep... I think you have to be aware of uncertainty in both those polls. Right. I mean, some people even suggest that, you know, Trump understands the structural change and is taking one of the last moments of real American hegemony to push outside the multilateral system to get better deals mm. from, from inside it because mm. America's power is slowly declining inevitably compared to China and Asia. Ichiro, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am a believer of uh, United States coming back, uh, like uh, Ministre Vetrin said, uh, ils reviendront d'un jour. Uh, but uh, how soon it is, uh, I, I don't know, of course, but I think it can be a temporary phenomenon. If I sound cynical, I'm sorry, but the uh, weakness of uh, intelligent anal analysts is that uh, you take what it is as something that should have happened. Three years ago, no one was saying that uh, Trump will win and Americans will <coughs> change like this. Now, a lot of people are saying Trump is a phenomenon. This had to happen. And I don't really believe in that kind of logic. Sorry to be very straightforward. And uh, I think maybe Mr. Trump denies values of your founding fathers, uh, democracy, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom and everything. But I think still a lot of Americans believe that. And that's why Mr. President doesn't have more than 40% uh, support. And so I still believe in that. Uh, maybe I'm too optimistic, but right, I feel, right, feel right, that right. way. No, but it is true. It's always easier to reinterpret the past. <laughs> Let's get some questions from the audience. Um, what I'd love, I'm sure we have microphones around. I see some hands, but I can't really see faces. So there's a gentleman with his hand up in the second row. Um, is there a microphone? Keep, keep going the second row, le deuxième, là. And then there's someone in like, looks like a yellow sweater. Okay. Okay, please. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Leishoubi, j'ai déjà intervenu. Ah oui. Je me suis présenté. Euh, le, le, je, je voudrais poser une question qui me semble essentielle. Cela a été esquissé, mais est-ce qu'on ne devrait pas se préoccuper du fait que Trump est aussi euh, le produit de l'échec des approches euh, précédentes Et donc, euh, il, il joue ce rôle de, de, de rupture. À partir de là, est-ce que l'analyse sur ces échecs et ces approches ne devrait pas être plus approfondie Première question, j'aimerais que mes amis panélistes y reviennent. Et, et est-ce qu'au-delà de Trump, quelles seraient les évolutions Parce qu'il est en échec par rapport aux approches précédentes. Les approches précédentes sont dénoncées, sont inefficaces. J'aimerais un œil, j'aimerais une analyse sur cette question. Et comment imagine-t-on les nouvelles évolutions à la lumière de cette contradiction Merci. OK, merci. Merci, monsieur. Euh, ouais. Oui, euh, Hervé Mariton. Euh, 
D'abord, en tant qu'Algérois, pour approuver la question de notre ami algérien, qui, sur le premier point, me paraît très importante, euh, les échecs qui ont conduit à Trump. But I would put two quick points. First, uh, how is it that uh, Trump still has a very large popular support? Are there that many idiots in the States? Or is it that Trump bashing, as we've heard from part of the panel this morning, has exactly the reverse effect? Second point, uh, Trump has probably uh, the uh, useful policy, and that was uh, part of the final analysis from our moderator, to uh, exert and try and exert some influence uh, towards and in a way against Chinese expansionism today. From its near vicinity, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and extended to Africa, indeed here in Morocco, and many countries in the, on the planet. So if Trump does not do that, who else? And in a way, a question maybe to Mr. Vedrine and others on the panel, uh, would it be imaginable that other parties on the planet, if not Trump, somebody else, some other country, takes that sort of responsibility, or is the world totally to the idea that there's one type of expansionism that has no answer, no reaction, and maybe a final conclusion, we may express many criticisms okay. towards, towards, towards Trump, it's not my cup of tea, but on freedom of speech, human rights, mm -hmm. I'd still rather live in the States than in China. Okay, very good. Um, could you pass the microphone behind you to your right? Could, um, and, and then, are, are there any questions over on this side? I can't see. Okay, anyway, please. And, 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 um, and, and if I could just ask you, I should have done before, just please identify yourself. Would you mind terribly? Yes. Everybody? <laughs> Riyad Abed du Liban. Ma question est ce que <coughs> l'unilatéralisme américain et la guerre commerciale menée euh, n'affaiblit pas le dollar comme euh, monnaie d'échange euh, dans le commerce international. Merci. Ok, merci monsieur. Let's take a couple more. There's right down in front. He, Madame, voila, and then um, there's a gentleman right. on the aisle there. Thank you. Can I go ahead? Please. Okay, I'm Jean-Pierre Cabestin from Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, all right, yes, um, general remark, it looks like Europeans believe more in Trump's words and less in, its, in his actions than the, the Asians. It looks like the Asians are more cautious and more concentrated in the actions of the Trump administration beyond the words it has uttered. So that's a general remark. Now, I have a specific question to Wang Ti so anyone um, who is um, based in the Asia Pacific region, is regarding the uh, US um, China confrontation. Now, in, in China, in the last few years, there was a there were a lot of debates about the U.S. decline. It looks like today this debate has been forgotten uh, because maybe the U.S. Uh, has um, uh, come back uh, to Asia. And the Trump administration in many ways has developed some kind of uh, super rebalancing policy towards, uh, towards, uh, towards China. And I'm happy that uh, Hubert Verdin mentioned the South China Sea because I would like to have uh, Wang Ti Se's view with another Asian representative on the panel on the um, risks of crisis in the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, I think Taiwan was just mentioned very briefly, but that's another hot spot we should uh, look at. Now the question is uh, whether there is a chance for such a, a crisis. And, um, the other issue is whether the Cold War, the, 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 the trade war between China and the US, uh, as you sort of alluded to, Aunt, is, uh, is going to uh, put enough pressure on the Chinese leadership to reform. And okay. I would like to have your own view on that. Great. It seems to me that it's uh, unlikely, but maybe you have another view. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. And Jawad Kartouti, je suis président de l'Institut marocain des relations internationales. Et j'ai deux questions pour M. Védrine. 
j'ai remarqué euh, que on a beaucoup parlé de l'Asie, on a beaucoup parlé de l'Europe, mais on n'a absolument pas parlé de l'Afrique. Alors, ma, ma question à M. Védrine, est-ce que euh, Trump a une politique africaine ou bien est-ce que ça l'intéresse absolument pas Ça, c'est ma première question. Euh, la deuxième, c'est concernant le conflit euh, israélo-palestinien. Euh, Trump est allé au-delà de tous les présidents précédents en reconnaissant Jérusalem comme capitale d'Israël, euh, en annulant toutes les aides qui étaient données par les États-Unis aux, aux Palestiniens et même en annulant la représentation palestinienne à Washington. Ouais. On parle d'un plan Trump pour le conflit israélo-palestinien. Et ma question à M. Védrine, est-ce que ce plan existe-t-il réellement et quels seraient ses contours Merci. Merci, monsieur. OK, let's, let's, go, let's come back here. Let's try to first answer the questions about Asia, Pacific, and um, worries about the South China Sea. Mr. Wang, would you like to start? Yes. Um, first, I'm in very much in agreement with my, Michael's point that the United States is changing, but not changing totally. I think some people say Trump is some kind of aberration in world politics, in U.S. politics. I don't totally agree, but I think, I think he represents, as I said earlier, the divisiveness in world politics. And uh, the divisiveness is caused by increased uh, economic inequality among many countries, and also the identity politics that is exacerbated by the economic inequality. So if we come to U.S.-China relations, I think uh, the relationship is influenced by their domestic politics. Uh, in the United States, uh, the criticisms of China are rising up, not only in, in the Trump administration, but in the political uh, community as a whole. So I don't think this is a short-term phenomenon because Trump is surrounded by people who, are, who have hostile or uh, strong reservations about China. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the South China Sea, and the Taiwan uh, question. The two sides do not want to fight a war over these islands or over Taiwan. But the tensions are rising up uh, because people in China hold nationalistic feelings, sentiments about the United States. And people in the United States are saying China is uh, trying to replace the United States uh, domination uh, in East Asia. Uh, but I think in, in the practical terms, uh, the two sides are very cautious mm -hmm. not to be engaged in uh, an actual military conflict. The two, two, uh, two militaries are talking to each other, and I think they will be somewhat reserved in uh, making a, uh, uh, some skirmishes. Uh, so I'm moderately optimistic about the South China Sea and Taiwan, but, uh, I mean, regardless of the rhetoric. Can I ask you, though, maybe a slightly difficult question? I mean, China has joined much of the world order and has asked everyone to obey the rules. And, and, and yet, the decision of the court about these islands has been totally ignored by China. And I wonder how that fits with the Chinese view that everyone should obey the rules except themselves. I think China says that it, it, it abides by international law and it is a, a, a contributor to uh, current world order. Uh, of course, their, their behavior uh, has uh, generated some concerns over the South China Sea and elsewhere, but I think uh, the preoccupation of China today is still domestic 
yes. economy. So I don't think China will be engaged in any adventurous uh, things abroad. Uh, going back to uh, the question about China's reform, I think uh, it is expected that China, the Communist Party will hold another plenum uh, after the party congress, and I, I hope these people have some expectations about economic reform. But I think economic reform may be uh, restored, but I think the political situation may remain uh, unchanged. Uh, okay. There's still a, a great deal of effort to consolidate uh, the power base of the Communist Party. Yes, 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 precisely. Mr. Fujisaki and then, and then uh, Michael. Very shortly, uh, our relations with China are improving, so I have to be rather cautious. But my personal view, uh, I have two concerns. One, about uh, South China Sea and other issues. Fait accompli, or you do things first and then extending smiling hands afterwards. I think that's a little concern to us. Second is uh, idea like AIIB or OBOR, One Belt, One Road, which we will discuss later. Great ideas, maybe, but it, does, it doesn't come this way that, hey, I have a good idea. Let's discuss to make it. It comes like, I have a good idea. Those who want to join, come on the board. I think these are the two small concerns I have on China's diplomacy. Okay, Michael, let's, let's, I mean, not, this is not aimed at you, but let's try to keep our responses short so we have time to go to the audience one more time, please. Can I respond to the, the gentleman in the yellow, in the yellow sweater, uh, who made the argument that Mr. Trump is confronting an expansionist China? I don't really see it that way. I don't recognize that in Mr. Trump's policies. The truth is he's been very inconsistent on China. During the campaign, he was very tough. During the first 18 months in office, he coddled China. He didn't confront China. You remember the Mar-a-Lago summit, the, all the, 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 the early love affair with um, Xi Jinping. Now, US policy on China has toughened up, for sure. The Pence speech, very tough, reminiscent of a sort of Cold War rollback approach to China. Why has that changed? I think trade is Mr. Trump's red line and I think he's angry about that. Secondly, he's pushing on an open door. The truth is that everybody in Washington has toughened on China. Democrats and Republicans are getting sick of Chinese foreign policy and there's a, it's very easy for Mr. Trump to make this argument. And also I think there's a sort of, there's a distraction element. While he's being attacked on Russia, he can give a big speech on China and say, look over there, there's nothing happening here. Look over at China. Uh, I think Mr. Trump will be tough, will con be continue to be tough on China's um, economic approach, but it's not clear to me, to come to the South China Sea issue, that he's going to take risks on really hard security issues because he hasn't done that to date and he doesn't care really about alliance guarantees. The idea that Donald Trump is going to uh, take big risks on the grounds of half-submerged water features in a waterway on the other side of the world seems very unlikely to me. The second point, just very quickly, Stephen, you also made the point, sir, about Trump bashing. And I think that's a fair point. I think Mr. Trump has had successes in his foreign policy. The two points I would make is, first of all, the, the scale of the successes are not what he says they are, and he doesn't care too much about the scale of the successes. So we have to be very careful in interrogating what those successes are. Mm -hmm. The second question I'd put to you, at what price do these successes come? Yes, the stronger party in a negotiation can always wring um, concessions out of the weaker party, but in the long term that will tend to undercut your reliability, your reputation and your prestige. And the genius of the US-led order after the Second World War was what the great American historian John Lewis Gaddis described as hegemony by consent. America achieved hegemony over much of the world by consent. The world consented in America's hegemony. But if you, if you, keep, if you misuse your power, if you're too strong, if you take every advantage you have, then that consent okay. will go away. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> you. That's great. Um, Mr. Roy, did you want to speak? And I just want to say that 
and then, and then we'll go to Mr. When uh, Kim Jong Un was shooting those missiles, China instead of trying to calm down the North Koreans, they punished South Korea when we put that anti-missile system. So how can you, you know, and it's for our own protection, it's a defense mechanism. So for China to punish, penalize South Korea for putting this system to defend ourselves. And Korea, we've been bullied um, uh, by the Chinese for 5,000 years. So it's, it's, it's in the DNA of the Chinese to uh, bully you uh, and threaten you. So I'd rather have some kind of a U.S. presence for, for uh, for try to uh, prevent some kind of adventurism from China. It's my personal opinion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vitrine, there are a number of questions addressed to you, so, s'il vous plaît. Oui, Steven, je réponds très vite aux deux questions de notre ami marocain, et j'ai une remarque globale pour terminer. Sur l'Afrique, Trump n'a pas de politique africaine globale, mais d'ailleurs personne n'a de politique africaine globale. Il peut avoir des politiques en Afrique, sur tel ou tel point particulier qui peut l'intéresser, Ce n'était pas le cas pour le moment et ce n'était pas majeur dans l'échange que nous avions. Deuxièmement, le plan sur Israël-Palestine, c'est un plan bantoustan, c'est tout. Il constate que le Likoud a gagné, en gros, que les pays arabes de la région ont d'autres soucis, que plus personne ne soutient la, la politique à deux États, sauf les Européens, notamment la France, avec un certain courage verbal. Mais voilà, donc ils vont, ils vont abuser de cette situation pour dire c'est à prendre ou à laisser, à mon avis. Sur, globalement, ce que je voulais dire, c'est que les Occidentaux ne retrouveront pas la maîtrise globale du système mondial. Il n'y a d'ailleurs pas de système mondial, il y a ce que Guterres appelle le, le chaos. Bon. Les Occidentaux n'y arriveront pas, les États-Unis n'y arriveront pas, même avec la brutalité de Trump. Les Occidentaux, en plus, ne sont pas d'accord entre eux sur ces questions. Je pense que la Chine n'y arrivera pas non plus. Je ne pense pas que ce soit d'ailleurs le projet de la Chine, et même si c'était son projet... Euh, Euh, nouveau, elle n'y arriverait pas parce qu'il y aura des systèmes quand même d'indigment par rapport à la Chine, confus, mais malgré tout. Les émergents, en général, n'ont pas d'unité entre eux. Regardez Inde, Chine, par exemple. Donc, on est dans un système de chaotique assez dur. Chaotique, ça ne veut pas dire la guerre, mais chaotique, durable, instable. Ce qui fait qu'à mon avis, il y a un rendez-vous devant nous entre les puissances installées depuis deux ou trois siècles qui sont quand même relativement sur la défensive, et les puissances montantes, qui sont montantes dans le désordre. Il y a un rendez-vous. Soit ça aura lieu à travers des, des dizaines de batailles dangereuses et pénibles sur tous les terrains, politiques, monétaires, militaires, etc., soit à un moment donné, s'organisera une sorte de discussion générale qui n'a pas eu lieu après la fin de l'Union soviétique, qui avait eu lieu après la fin de la Première Guerre mondiale, pas très bien, après la fin de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, plutôt bien, et qui n'a pas eu lieu. Donc ma seule idée simple, c'est que ce rendez-vous n'est pas derrière nous. Il ne s'agit pas simplement de faire en sorte que les pays récalcitrants ou contestataires s'intègrent au système qui a déjà été organisé et qui est magnifique. Je pense que le rendez-vous est devant nous. Et ça pose des questions très 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 compliquées aux puissances qui étaient les puissances dominantes d'avant. C'est plus compliqué que pour les autres, donc pour les Européens. Merci. Um, Igor, I don't want to put you on the spot, but... One of the things Mr. Vitrine just said, which is always intriguing me, is we have traditional powers, we have rising powers. There's clearly a change. There's a co Where does Russia see itself in this? I mean, does it see itself part of the future or hanging on to the past? Uh, <clears throat> By the course of events, uh, our politics were reactive because we do not represent uh, the power and potential economic and military one of the Soviet Union, but we still thought of ourselves as the adversary of the United States and in this bipolar competition. The Ukrainian crisis, Syrian crisis were the reaction to this. At the moment, it's obvious that we cannot take this burden upon ourselves uh, alone. But through dual containment of the United States, of China and of Russia, we are organizing counter-dual containment of the United States. So we can be allies of China at the moment. Uh, hypothetically, if something goes very well uh, beyond Putin, then we can go back to the Western world. But at the moment, uh, until 2024 at least, I don't think it will happen. You know, I mean, in a way, some people maybe it's a joke, but they suggest that 
Putin is doing to the United States what Nixon did to the Soviet Union by moving toward China. Something like that, yes. and uh, he's a very good player in this, and tactically, I think that we made a lot of successes. We're back in the Middle East, and we can uh, bargain uh, uh, our Palestinian-Arab-Turkish-Iranian connections, uh, on, and we can, we can be a player, and we can pretend to go back on the top table, mm -hmm. but the weakness is, is the economy, demography, and other things, and in the long run, we cannot play this role anymore. Okay, thanks. Um, we have eight minutes, so I'd like to take a couple more questions. I don't know if Jim Lowenstein's out there. If he is, we had talked about a question. So if, Jim, you're out there somewhere, stand up. Um, where? Okay. Okay, could you? Give him a microphone, please. Thank you, Jeff. Jim, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm a retired American diplomat, so of course what I worry about is the image of the United States. Uh, to what degree do you think uh, Europeans and Asians separate their reaction to President Trump from their uh, opinion uh, on the United States? Thank you. A uh, couple more. I mean, in the front, is it Carrie? I can't see. There's a woman in the front row, please. Yeah. As someone who has a foot on either side of the Atlantic, I wonder if we might not also look at Trump as someone who puts his finger on the divisions, as Rosalind was, uh, was referring to, of the, the losers in the, in the transition to a knowledge economy the people in the north of England who voted for Brexit, uh, the people perhaps in the French countryside, that he's putting, uh, that he's not simply an American phenomenon, perhaps in an internal or a domestic policy way. Okay, thanks. And can you just hand the microphone? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, Merci. I've also two fits on each side of the Atlantic. Uh, I have two, two comments, remark, question. One, I think Beyond the trade war or so-called trade difficulties between China and the United States, it seems to me that the real issue is more market access. I would say reciprocal market access. What we've seen lately is attempts in the U.S. to block some investments in, by Chinese companies, particularly in certain sensitive sectors. And we have a process called Cyphers that some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. We've seen uh, it's harder for Chinese company to invest abroad at the same time, probably the Chinese authority don't want to spend that much money outside of the country because as one of the panelists said, the issues are more on the domestic side. So this is one aspect. The other thing that I would like, there's been, as Hervé Mariton was pointing out, some, uh, I would say, Trump bashing. And a lot of people don't like Trump for a variety of reasons, which I perfectly understand. I'd like to make two remarks. One, On he's, breath, been elected, okay. he's been elected. I mean, some people said he didn't get uh, he's more. He's been elected. But he's been elected, he's the president. And the second thing, he's elected by the Americans. Everybody has a view on who should be the president of the United States. But be aware of something, only the American votes. Thank you very much. So let's have one more question, but let's try to have a question about Trump. Um, we've, we've wandered around, I think, in a very, in, in a very interesting way. But uh, let's get one last question about Mr. Trump. I see gentleman with his hand up there, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tatsu Masa from Japan. I have a question to former Minister Mushu Verlin. If you put in the shoes of historian, for example, in 1980, uh, more than 50% of the world's GDP was produced by two countries, China and India. And if history may repeat itself, and if many people predict by 2050, China will be by far the largest country in the world in terms of military, economic, political power. Do you think this course of history could be interrupted by something happening between China and the United States now? Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks very, very much. We, we, we don't have tons of time, so let's first try to have a quick 
responses to um, the question about America's image abroad and, and Mr. Trump. Michael, go ahead. Well, but, but, polling, but let's just be brief if we po can. Polling Sorry. data gives us the answer to that. Most Western countries at the moment are distinguishing between their view of the United States and their view of Mr. Trump. And in the Australian case, for example, still seven or eight out of 10 Australians believe that the alliance is important to our security, but only 30% of Australians respect Mr. Trump. I worry, though, in the long term, if you think of the, the murder of Mr. Khashoggi, the, the disappearance of the Chinese Interpol chief, for example, these are the kinds of questions that in the past we would have relied on, expected the United States, the President of the United States to take a lead on. Now that doesn't happen. What does it mean that someone like Erdogan of Turkey is a greater advocate of press freedom and of getting to the truth of Mr. Kosoji's uh, uh, murder than the President of the United States? And the final thing I'd say is, what if Mr. Trump is re-elected? It's one thing for us to suspend disbelief when America elects him once, but what if he's re-elected? Uh, Roz, do you have a, a thought on this? Or am I putting you in a spot? Uh, on the image abroad, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a great position okay. to, to describe that. I can talk a little bit about his image in the US, but. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll hear a lot about mid-November, mid yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, would anyone else like to, Igor, what's, what does Trump look like? Hello? Sorry. We have inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Americans, but we have a superiority complex either. So this is a dissonance <laughs> cognitive, total. So uh, the, the rich people of, in, in Russia would, would run to the United States, buy properties and, and enjoy life. But coming back, they would bash Trump, Americans and all of that stuff. So it's very situational. And then, for example, on the 11th of November in Paris, uh, by some mir uh, miracle, Putin strikes a deal with Trump, then uh, six, month, six days later, the public opinion of Russia being brainwashed by television would say that 16% of the Russian population is strongly for Trump. Yes, uh, I'm afraid both our populations are a little bit the same way. Mr. Wang. Uh, I, I think Trump, it's difficult to separate Trump from the United States. In the sense, in, in China, for instance, uh, Trump is trying, uh, his administration is trying to uh, uh, drive some Chinese presence, uh, presence from the United States. Chinese students, Chinese businesses, so that hurts the United States image in China. Basically, the United States still enjoys a, a, a lot of uh, popularity, especially among the Chinese younger intellectuals and students. But if they are denied access to U.S. universities, they will have to go somewhere else, Australia, <laughs> Great Britain, and, and other countries. So it depends on whether that kind of policy will continue. Yes, thank you. Um, Ichiro, I think you're probably going to have the last word, so uh, go ahead. Just uh, one word. Uh, because uh, Japan's relations uh, with the United States has been so close and so strong up till now, uh, we were able to uh, distinguish the two, Trump and the United States. I hope this will last long. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, listen, we are out of time. I apologize to those who wanted to ask questions, and, and I failed to let you do that. So. My apologies, but my thanks to this panel for a really interesting discussion. All the best. Cheers. Thank you.